Hero shooters are a relatively new genre in video games, with roots in the late 90s and 2000s. The genre itself was somewhat difficult to define, as many aspects of the genre fit into other genres. Despite this, I am going to attempt to do it anyway. A hero shooter is a first person or third person multiplayer shooter, in which players can choose from a roster of characters that each have their own abilities, creating a variation in gameplay between each of them. Typically, these games focus on team based multiplayer modes, where two teams of players are competing against each other over an objective. Some hero shooters have player versus environment modes or PvE modes, in which a team or a team of players has to compete against computer controlled enemies. Often, hero shooters are designed in such a way that each character in a team's unique abilities are useful for a specific niche in their team while they are weaker elsewhere. This is used effectively in both PvP and PvE game modes, where in order to be the most successful, a team has to understand each character within a team's strengths and weaknesses to cooperate and use them most effectively. For example, this could be a healer class pairing up with a tank class to absorb damage, which in turn provides cover for the more fragile damage classes and allows them to engage in combat more effectively. You might have noticed that he used the word class to describe characters on a team. Often class is literally just a label for a character in a game, among other labels like mercenary or hero. Other times, class is often used to describe the general role of characters in a game, such as medic from TF2 and mercenary from Overwatch, both being support slash healing classes, or heavy from TF2 and all star from Garden Warfare, both being tank classes. Sometimes there can even be more broad labels for characters, like dividing each character's roles into attacking, defending, or supporting. This is where the genre connects with other genres, with non-hero shooter games like Battlefield also having roles like Assault and Support. The distinction between hero shooters and other genres is that hero shooters take these broad roles and break them down further into more unique characters, a trait that is almost always accompanied with each character in a game having their own unique personality and story. With that lengthy description of hero shooters out of the way, I can finally get to the main topic of this video. I'm going to be talking about the development of hero shooters throughout the years, from the oldest games that started at all to the most modern games in the genre. I'm going to be looking at the most significant games in the genre in chronological order, giving each of them a description of their gameplay design and overall impact on the genre as a whole. While this video is going to cover games that matter to the genre, it should be noted that the video will not cover every game. This is because of many things, but it's mostly because it the game either has issues with being defined as a hero shooter or doesn't matter to the western perspective from which this video is written. This means that I will not be covering crappy old DOS games that might have been a true pioneer as a hero shooters, nor the Chinese Team Fortress 2. For fans of such games, you can leave an angry complaint in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Anyways, if you end up enjoying the video and can see the effort that I put into it, show your appreciation by liking the video and subscribing. If you have any questions, compliments, or concerns, leave a comment and I'll probably read it. Or of fun and engagement, go ahead and comment your favorite hero shooter. Additionally, if you guys want to hang out, you can check out the Discord in the description, and you might get the message to me once in a blue moon. With that introduction out of the dun doodly way, let's begin. <laughs> The hero shooter genre had some rather humble beginnings in the midst of the early to mid 1990s. During this time, id Software was the king of FPS games on PC, with releases like Doom and Quake that were must play games at the time. Both of these games had significant multiplayer scenes, but Doom had a multiplayer scene mostly composed of sweaty nerds covered in pizza grease having a LAN party in their mother's basement, so Quake ended up being a more significant game in developing the modern online gaming world of today. When Quake was popular, technology had developed enough for computers to communicate more effectively, so sweaty nerds could play games together without having to be in the same basement. This new technology was also giving way to the birth of the widespread internet, which itself gave birth to some of the first online gaming communities like Quakes. These opportunities, combined with the fact that id was pretty relaxed when it came to people modding their games, and you end up with the perfect recipe for a big modding community to form around Quake. People began to make mods that essentially featured full-on unique game modes. One such game was the original Team Fortress, released on August 24th, 1996. Truth be told, the original Team Fortress is pretty much all of the defining characteristics of the genre. There are several characters, or as they're known in Team Fortress, mercenaries to choose from, each with their own unique weapons and abilities. Team Fortress, as the name strongly implies, puts players into teams, which surprisingly at the time of the game's release was actually a deviation from the typical free-for-all deathmatch gameplay of Quake. Upon the game's initial release, Team Fortress only had five classes, but eventually, after several updates, the game had eventually reached the iconic class count of 10. What? 
Were you expecting another count? I don't know what you're talking about. Anyways, the existence of so many mercenaries within Team Fortress really helps to define the game as the first hero shooter. In Team Fortress, there's vast differences in mobility, health, and weapons across the mercs. The differences between mercenaries and Team Fortress are so vast, each mercenary clearly has roles that they can do best and some that they can do worst. And Team Fortress was pretty much the first game to be like this, at least within the scope of the FPS format. In its heyday, the mod received good attention and praise for being original. In comparison, another genre pioneering game at the time was Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike did have some great innovations and ideas of its own, but even in Counter-Strike, every player has the exact same stats with no variations, which was pretty typical of FPS games at the time. Team Fortress, on the other hand, does offer variety in these aspects. This unique design, along with the tons of design potential that had just been unlocked by Team Fortress, sparked an interest from a studio that was pretty fresh on the scene at the time. That's right, it was Valve and their soon-to-be mind-bending godlike CEO, Gabe Newell. Hi, this is Gabe. With Valve's Half-Life receiving praise and profits, the company was looking for some new talent and innovation. In this search, they found two eye-catching mods, those being Counter-Strike and our beloved Team Fortress. After some time working together with the original modding team, Valve released Team Fortress as a standalone game. To be honest, nothing really changed with the release of Team Fortress as its own game, with Team Fortress just getting polished up and not receiving any crazy updates. After Team Fortress's independent release, we see a major gap in the timeline of significant hero shooters. I don't have a definitive answer as to why this is the case, but I can only assume that it's just because nobody but Valve were cool enough to really pick up on the idea of the hero shooter. We now know that this nearly decade-long gap was not just wasted time, as Valve and the original Team Fortress co-designer Robin Walker were working on a Team Fortress sequel. But before I get into TF2, let's first discuss what major contributions Team Fortress made to the genre. Obviously, the biggest contribution Team Fortress made was inventing the genre. It created the basic fundamentals of hero shooters, like having several playable characters, each of their own unique abilities and weapons. Team Fortress put the players into teams, a feature of the genre that was never strayed away from for the next decade and a half until Apex Legends. From these contributions, it might easily seem like the concept of the hero shooter was already perfect at its birth, but trust me, we still have a long way to go. After 9 years and some of the roughest, toughest development this side of the Mississippi, Team Fortress 2 was released to the public on October 10th, 2007, and the world would soon find out that it was well worth the wait. Upon release, the game had a very positive reception, not only because of it being a well-designed and fun game, but also because of how it was unique at a time in which the most popular FPS games were generic yearly release games like Call of Duty. However, this isn't to say that the game was perfect at launch. Notably, there was a lack of content in the game, with each class only having their default weapons and the game lacking that many game modes. But this didn't last for long, with many updates soon coming to the rescue. For the next 10 years after TF2's release, Valve would provide heaps of content for the game, featuring new weapons, game modes, maps, and lore. The addition of lore and a new PvE game mode, Man vs. Machine, were imported to the evolution of the hero shooter genre, and there's going to be a lot more on MVM later. Overall, the updates that Valve provided let TF2 live a very long life, and by that, I mean that the game is still going to this day, even though there hasn't been a major update in over 6 years. TF2 really has an incredibly dedicated and pretty sizable community, especially for the age of the game and the dire circumstances that it finds itself in. As such, TF2 remains a golden standard for the hero shooter genre, even with the release of more modern titles. The core gameplay of TF2 is pretty much the same as the original Team Fortress gameplay. The player can choose from a cast of 9 mercenary classes, a slight step down from the previous 10 classes, which is due to the civilian mercenary being sent to the Shadow Realm. The remaining mercenaries are the same as in Team Fortress Classic, those being Scout, Soldier, Pyro, Heavy, Demoman, Engineer, Medic, Sniper, and Spy. The mercenaries are listed each in that order on the character select screen, which serves to put the mercenaries into three main groups. Scout, Soldier, and Pyro are grouped as Offense, Heavy, Demoman, and Engineer are grouped as Defense, and Medic, Sniper, and Spy are grouped as Support. If you really know the ins and outs of these classes, these groupings seem pretty confusing. Confusing. For example, Engineer is grouped as a defense class, even though his most important role is arguably supporting his team through the dispenser and the teleporter. This sort of reasonable
variable and sort of arbitrary grouping that TF2 puts its nine classes into, Akira throughout history, as some other hero shooters group the characters into offense, defense, or support, though the names for such roles have been shuffled. In any case, the designs of the nine TF2 mercenaries were important to the development of the genre, because they aren't just a collection of generic soldier characters, but aren't said characters, with individual personalities and stories. A lot of this personality and lore is shown in non-game content, like YouTube videos and comics, but you can easily figure out each mercenary's personality just by playing the game. The existence of so much character and personality in the game was pretty important, because it was one of the defining features of the hero shooter genre. In hero shooters in TF2, you aren't just playing some random nameless soldier, you're playing a fun character with personality and story, like an insanely patriotic American or a fat sandwich eating Russian. Anyways, in terms of mercenary weapons and abilities, there's a lot to unpack. In TF2, there aren't really that many abilities baked into the characters, Chicken. and instead abilities are provided to the mercenaries through their weapon sets. For example, Spy isn't some god that can turn invisible through magic, as that ability actually just comes from the invisibility watch that he can equip. This is where the greatest part of TF2's design comes in, the ability to fully customize your loadout. Now, this feature isn't unique in TF2 in any way, but the way in which it is used is unique. As the TF2 mercenaries' abilities are dictated by their weapons, you can alter any mercenaries' abilities by changing loadouts. For example, remember how Spy can go invisible through his watch? Well, you can switch to a watch that won't let you go directly invisible, but will let you fake your death through invisibility whenever, whenever you take damage. Because of this fairly straightforward weapon design, it's very easy to understand how different loadouts and their different abilities can be used for different needs, and this creates a ton of fun gameplay through experimentation and variety. This aspect of TF2's gameplay carries on to some other games in hero shooters, but out of any one of them, I personally believe that TF2 does it the best. TF2's ability customization shines through the most through the subclasses that the game has. The subclasses are classes within classes that alter the gameplay of their parent class so much that they might as well be their own class. The most obvious example of this is Demo Knight, who takes Demo Man's ranged explosive capabilities and throws them away in favor of melee excellence. Demo Knight's gameplay is completely different than normal Demo Man's gameplay, making Demo Knight a subclass. From Demo Knight to other subclasses like Battle Engineer and Huntsman Sniper, there's tons of layers to TF2's classes that make TF2's variation in gameplay even greater. Other hero shooter games, particularly the Garden Warfare games, take this subclass idea and make it less about loadouts and make it more just about choosing a variation of a character. More on this later, but for now, let's take a quick look at Garden Warfare's All-Star, who has a bunch of sports-based variations like Rugby Star, Golf Star, and Wrestling Star. But again, more on Garden Warfare later. Beyond heavy customizability, TF2 has a lot to offer in terms of game flow. A typical game of TF2 takes place in one of five major game modes, those being Control Points, Attack and Defend, Payload, King of the Hill, and Capture the Flag. All of these game modes feature two teams competing over objectives, and this aspect of TF2 is nothing special, as plenty of other games feature identical or similar game modes. What happens within these game modes is what matters. As I said before, in a hero shooter game, the winning strategy is to cooperate to use each of your team's character's abilities most effectively, and TF2 displays this incredibly. You can pick any class you want in TF2, regardless of your team's composition. Occasionally, this results in you having an entire team made out of just scouts, but generally you end up with a varied mix of mercenaries. This is where the symphony of TF2 forms, where everyone works together, whether they know it or not, and win the game for their team. Medics usually follow the biggest class cluster of players on their team. This cluster is usually composed of tank and damage classes, like Heavy, Soldier, Demo Man, and Pyro. The medics provide the main damage cluster support in the form of healing and ubers, and the damage cluster gives the medics defense in return. They do this while the engineers follow, moving their buildings along with the team to either defend the point or to help put pressure on a point during offense. The remaining mercenaries on a team, Scout, Sniper, and Spy, are usually away from this main force, instead going off to annoy the enemy team through using instant and kill attacks and throwing jars of milk. This, combined with loadout customization and the freedom to choose any mercenary, all culminates in a game flow that feels natural and has order, but at the same time is vastly varied and fresh every time. This general flow of gameplay occurs in all hero shooters to varying degrees, and this is what makes the hero shooter genre so unique. Take a non-hero shooter game like Fortnite and imagine yourself in a squad game. You and your three teammates are all equal. You all have the same health, the same speed, and the same abilities. The only differences between you are what weapons and materials you've picked up along your way, which means that XX Dorito Smasher 2012 
XX has the same abilities as Grimbley Dude 2009X. This is not true for hero shooters like TF2. As I mentioned before, TF2 got a significant amount of updates in its long life, and one of those updates was the Man vs. Machine update. This update added a brand new and very different game mode to TF2, one in which a team of 6 players fights hordes of robots in order to stop them from getting to the bomb hatch and deploying the bomb. The idea of PvE was definitely not invented by TF2, with other game modes like COD Zombies being influential to the PvE format in their own right. However, TF2 was the first hero shooter to introduce such a game mode, and MVM really shows off the huge amount of potential that PvE modes and hero shooters can have. The 9 mercenaries, already having their own strengths and weaknesses in normal multiplayer, have their designs taken to the next level with MVM's upgrade system. In MVM, players earn money through destroying robots, and this money can be spent on upgrades for just about anything, including upgrading the flesh and bones of your character to make them more resistant to attacks like explosives. Different class weapons have different upgrade paths, and some of these paths add new and never before seen abilities to weapons, like with Pyro's Gas Pastor, which is usually a fairly terrible weapon in standard multiplayer, but is a great weapon in NVM because of the Explode on Ignite upgrade. New weapon abilities aren't the only upgrades available, of course, and as the game progresses, players can keep up with the increasing hordes of robots by giving their weapons upgrades like higher damage, firing speed, ammo capacity, and reload speed. Players have the ability to give their mercenaries simple things like speed and jump height increases, but players can also give their mercenaries resistances to certain damage types, like crit resistance so you don't burst into a ragdoll form upon the impact of a critical rocket upon your soft and weak flesh. Importantly, in MVM, the players aren't the only ones that have unique abilities, unlike other modes like COD Zombies where all of the standard zombies are the same mindless drones. In MVM, the robots are imitations of the 9 mercenaries, with medic bots, soldier bots, scout bots, etc. This means that they too can take advantage of the mercenaries' unique abilities, and it's up to the players to strategize in order to prevent them from doing that. For example, medic bots can ubercharge whichever robot they're healing instantly if either one of them takes any damage. The way to stop medic robots from doing this is to kill them in one shot, which is a job best performed by a class that specializes in doing such a thing, like Pyro, Demo Man, or Sniper. However, robotic versions of the mercenaries aren't the only robots in town, and there's a couple of unique enemies in MVM. The first one is the Sentry Buster, which, as the name implies, busts engineer sentries. This serves as a counter against what would otherwise be a really overpowered ability, but a Sentry Buster can be countered too, through either killing it or tricking it into blowing up without destroying during the century. The other unique robot is the tank, which is a massive and slow moving vehicle that has a ton of health. This forces the team to take their damage away from other robots, and from this you might expect that somebody like Heavy would shred the tank to bits, but this is far from the case. Heavy has a huge damage debuff against tanks, rendering him rather useless against them. And instead, tank busting classes like Pyro and specific sniper and engineer loadouts are the most effective against the tanks. The result of this is that classes that typically have a support role within MV are taken away to focus on the tank, making things on our front lines harder for damage classes like Heavy because they'll have much less support. Overall, the variety in enemies makes MVM extremely interesting and fun because of the huge amount of ways that you can counter enemies through your own huge variety in abilities. Because of this, I think that TF2 has the best PvE mode out of any hero shooter or really any game in general. Spoilers for what's to come, but when Overwatch 2 was promising a PvE mode with upgrades and abilities like TF2's MVM, people were really reasonably quite excited about that. Of course, this game mode was never fully realized because Blizzard really stinks, but more on that later. In summary, TF2's contributions to the hero shooter genre cannot be understated. Most importantly, it revived interest in the genre by providing a modern sequel to the ancient original Team Fortress. It introduced a huge aspect of personality and character into the genre, an aspect that all hero shooter games since have had. TF2 introduced loadouts to the genre and showed how they can be used to affect characters' abilities in very in depth ways. With these loadouts being so varied, TF2 also introduced the idea of variation within classes through subclasses, an idea that is explored in some other hero shooters and interesting in different ways. The hero shooter genre also saw its first PvE game mode in TF2, with MVM being both awesome and incredibly well designed. If the original Team Fortress is the grandfather of hero shooters, Team Fortress 2 is the father, with TF2 influencing modern games much more than old grandpa Team Fortress. <laughs> Thank you.
Initially, the Plants vs. Zombies series, or PvZ, seem like a really odd series for a hero shooter game. The first two PvZ games are tower defense games where plants shoot a bunch of stuff at a bunch of zombies. It's rather simple and a rather fun concept, but it doesn't really feel like it could be a hero shooter on the surface. But if you really think about it, PvZ was the perfect candidate for a hero shooter adaptation. All of the plants had their own unique weapons and abilities, and through a series of comics and media, their own stories and personalities. The other side, or team, the zombies had much of the same potential, with standout zombies like All Star and Dr. Zomboss already existing, but through some more comics and a bit of imagination, you could easily make a bunch more unique zombies. Coupled this huge potential with PopCap's tragic acquisition by EA, a company infamous for thirsting for profitable multiplayer shooters, and you get a miracle. On February 25th, 2014, Panth vs. Zombies Garden Warfare was released to the public. The game got a good response upon its release, and because PvZ is a fairly family-friendly franchise, it got an audience across all age groups. In fact, Garden Warfare is so family-friendly that my dear friend CJ played it as one of his very first FPS games when it first came out. At the time, me and him would have been just a bit under 6 years old, so this kind of game was his jam, though I think I was too busy twiddling my fingers in the corner of my room to really play the game myself during that time. Anyways, the gameplay of Garden Warfare being one of the first hero shooters was praised for being rather novel at the time of its release. But of course, people saw the similarities between Garden Warfare and TF2. Those similarities go beyond gameplay too, with both games having a cartoony art style and a humorous tone to their worlds. Additionally, Garden Warfare doesn't have that many playable characters, which ends up making the game look more like a non-hero shooter than it really should. If Garden Warfare 2 hadn't been released of an increased roster, then I'm pretty sure there would be much more debate on whether Garden Warfare counts as a hero shooter or not. At its core, Garden Warfare isn't much of an evolution from TF2. You pick a character, engage with some basic multiplayer gameplay, and that's it. Garden Warfare's biggest change is introducing a different roster of characters to choose from for each team. On one side, you have the plants, and on the other side, you have the zombies. You can't play a zombie when you're on the plants team, and you can't play a plant when you're on the zombies team. It's really simple stuff. However, while there are different rosters and thus different characters, some characters do have analogous versions of themselves on the opposite team. For example, the pea shooter on the plants team is similar in role to the trooper on the zombies team, but both of them being basic assault classes. One way to explain this is to imagine a world in which TF2 did the same thing. On the red team, you'd have the 9 mercenaries that we already know and love, and on the other team, you'd have the shadow clones of them that perform the same job but in slightly different ways. In PvZ, there are two pairs of analogous classes, and four characters which are more unique, which all combined compose the eight total main playable characters. The two analogous pairs are Pea Shooter and Trooper for the general assault role, and Sunflower and Scientist for the general healer role. The more unique characters in the roles are Chopper for melee, Cactus for sniper, Engineer for support, and All Star for tank. Each character in Garden Warfare has their own primary weapon and three abilities, as well as different health pools. Just like in all hero shooter games, most of Garden Warfare's gameplay consists of trying to use your character's unique abilities in the most efficient ways possible. Now, Garden Warfare having 8 characters seems like it's not a lot of characters, and that's easily what it looks like from a quick surface glance of the game. You could just assume that PvZ just copies TF of 2's loadout system to create its own variation and fun, but this isn't true. You can't customize your character's loadouts in Garden Warfare in the same way you could in TF2, and instead, you swap a character out for a variant of that character. This replaces the loadout system and makes switching playstyles for any given class easier, but it also removes a lot of the fun mixing and matching from TF2's loadout system. Regardless, this is where most of the content in Garden Warfare comes from. Each of the 8 main playable characters has 6 to 8 variations, which includes the default variation, which means that in total, counting all default forms and variants across all characters, there are a total of 57 variations. From this, you could think that this means that the game has 57 different playable characters, but really, the differences between variants of a character aren't really big enough to count them as separate characters. Variants just replace the primary attack of their base character with a different attack, and beyond that, the only other thing that they change is the character's cosmetic appearance. For example, a normal pea shooter's primary projectile is a normal pea, but Fire P, a variation of P shooters, primary projectile is a flaming P. All main characters in Garner Warfare can upgrade their primary weapons, but these upgrades don't change when switching to a variant. In our example, a normal P shooter can upgrade their primary with hyper plant food, extra peas, and super P ammo, while a fire P can upgrade their primary with heated plant food, extra hot peas, and incendiary P ammo. These different upgrades do the same thing, but they just have different names because that's funny. All of this variation stuff is cool, but it doesn't come for free. You can unlock variants by 
collecting the stickers that correspond to that variant until you have all of them. These collectible stickers come at random from sticker packs that you can buy with coins. And of stickers having varying levels of rarity, variants have varying levels of difficulty to unlock. This loot box character unlock mechanic seems a classic EA microtransaction design, and it absolutely is, but it isn't the worst thing in the world. While you can spend your real hard earned cash to buy coins, you don't really have to, because if you want, you can just play the game and very slowly earn coins. All game modes offer coin rewards for playing them, but one game mode offers more than the others. Garden Ops is Garden Warfare's own PvE game mode, and it's similar to Man vs. Machine in some ways, but much different than others. In Garden Ops, you play on a plant team by yourself or with a squad of 2 to 4 players. Your main objective in Garden Ops is to plant a garden in one of three locations around a map, and then defend that garden from waves of computer controlled zombies. Every five waves, you can encounter a boss wave, which involves spinning a slot machine that chooses what you will be fighting during the boss wave, along with giving you a chance at a potential coin reward. Overall, Garden Ops is much simpler than NVM. This mostly just comes from the fact that Garden Ops features no upgrade system like NVMs, and players just have to play with the base stats and abilities of their characters. Additionally, unlike with NVM's cast of diverse robots, the zombies in Garden Ops aren't designed in such a way that only some characters are effective against them, so all of the playable plants are equally effective at fighting against just about any zombie. Combine these factors with the fact that Garden Warfare already has a less character variation than TF2, and you end up with a PvE game mode that's very simple. The only strategy involved is choosing who to play and what you're going to plant around your garden. Because within the player's garden, players can build up support by using pots to plant allies. These allies, much like in the original Plants vs. Zombies games, stay in place and act much like tower defense units. However, this interesting tower defense mechanic isn't just in Garden Ops, as pods can be found in standard multiplayer maps. In fact, zombies have their own version of plant pods that come with small piles of dirt found around maps, from which a player can choose to spawn a computer controlled zombie that can move around, unlike potted plants. On both teams, some of these spawnable allies attack the enemy, while others support the team, mostly through the providing of healing. The potted plants and spawnable zombies mechanic is unique to the Garden of Warfare franchise, and it does provide an interesting layer of gameplay that is found nowhere else, at least within the hero shooter genre. Overall, the biggest thing that the first Garden of Warfare contributed to the hero shooter genre was simplifying the foundation that TF2 had laid. TF2's complex loadout system was swapped for Garden Warfare's much simpler variant system, and Garden Warfare's PvE game mode, Garden Ops, is also much simpler than TF2's MVM. This simplification isn't really a bad thing, its evolution is about improving while also making things easier. Garden Warfare took its chance to change things up, as it was the first hero shooter outside of the Team Fortress games. From Garden Warfare onwards, hero shooter character designs are much more like Garden Warfare's, with most hero shooter games focusing on giving players a wide variety of characters to play with instead of a wide variety of weapons to play with like we see in TF2. On December 1st, 2015, the world was introduced to what I would consider to be the most relevant hero shooter of today, at least as of the writing of this video. The Rainbow Six franchise had a few games prior to Siege, but previous games in the franchise didn't really count as hero shooters, and as a result, Siege was the first game to count as one. The most important thing about Siege is that it is the most important thing about Siege is that it was the first hero shooter game to stray from gameplay that involved extended combat like TF2 and Garden Warfare, as Siege opted for a design in which weapons are more realistically effective. This means that any hit to the head deals an instant kill, and the rest of an operator's body can only sustain a few hits, which is in stark contrast to a game like TF2, where most mercenaries can sustain multiple direct hit rockets to their faces. The result of this realistic design is gameplay that requires players to pay a lot of attention, as any enemy getting just a few sneaky hits on you can be devastating. Because of this straightforward combat, a lot of the new character abilities in Siege focus on helping players be more aware of other players, as all some characters have more supportive abilities, like healing, and some have more defensive abilities like shields. At launch, Siege had 8 characters, or as they're called in Siege, Operators. Unlike TF2 and Garden Warfare's set in stone character roster, Siege's Operator Count Siege's Operator Count has grown through several updates to a total of 72, at least as of the writing of this video. Some Operators come from previous Rainbow Six media, like games and books, and some other Operators are brand new. These 72 Operators are 
split across teams, much like in Garden Warfare. But unlike in Garden Warfare, pretty much all of Siege's matches consist of a conflict between distinct attackers and distinct defenders. As a result, operators on the attacking team have more offense-oriented abilities, and operators on the defense team have more defense-oriented abilities. This was an aspect of Garden Warfare, but it's much more pronounced in Siege. This makes the difference in gameplay between the two teams much larger than the this makes the difference in gameplay between the two teams much larger than the differences found within Garden Warfare and TF2. Operators in Siege have much less variation in stats and weapons than what is usually found in other hero shooters. Each operator only has two stats assigned to them, and those are speed and armor. Speed and armor come in three levels of quality, but these stats are balanced evenly. If a character has level 3 speed, they'll have level 1 armor and vice versa, though some operators are perfectly balanced and have just a level 2 of both of them. The resulting variation in health and speed is decently important, as though it often matters very little when headshots are often enough to kill anybody, and when player movement is limited inside of the game's small indoor environments. Each operator in Siege has a set of weapons that they can choose from, though there's usually just two or three primaries to pick from. All of these weapons are realistically designed guns, which is to say that they all shoot bullets that act like bullets. Headshots are always headshots across all weapons, but variations in weapon accuracy and recoil means that some weapons are easier to headshot with than others. Weapons vary the most in effectiveness across environments. This is really just basic weapon fundamentals, like shotguns being best at close range and snipers being best at long range. Just like in every other hero shooter, what makes different operators in Siege special are their unique abilities. Abilities are often attached to an operator's primary weapon, sometimes even being the primary weapon, and other times, abilities are just funny little gadgets that the operator uses. Abilities are all unique to their operator, though most most abilities can be generally categorized into their intended purposes. For example, shield operators like Montan all have a shield in place of their primaries, and all of them serve the purpose of being incredibly annoying. It's within these smaller groupings that variation becomes the most apparent. Clash is a shield operator, and she succeeds at being the most annoying shield operator because her shield is massive and has a unique shock ability that deals damage and slows down enemies. Overall, there's a number of roles that an ability can fall into, of those being Restricting enemy access, which is accomplished by barriers and traps. Detecting enemies, which is accomplished by cameras and scans. Directly supporting teammates, which is accomplished by providing things like health and armor. And denying damage, which is accomplished by shields. Much like in TF2, an effective team in Siege is a team of a diverse set of abilities that also effectively coordinates all of their abilities, which means that communication is key to being a successful team of men in Siege, and just about any other hero shooter too. Matches in Siege have a very very standard layout, and whether it's casual or competitive, all matches are 5v5. Matches take place on a map in which defenders are spawned on one of a few objectives, and they have to defend that objective, obviously. Objectives vary between many different types of objectives, like bomb, hostage, and area control objectives, but the only differences between objectives are the differences in victory conditions for the attackers, like having them try to defuse a bomb or extract a hostage. The defenders' objectives are hidden from the attackers when a round starts. But attackers have about a minute to drone around the map to find the objective, while the defenders are building their defenses. When the round really begins, attackers spawn outside of the map's main structure and have to break in in order to get to the objective. This is accomplished by breaking through windows, doors, and hatches, although these entry points are usually boarded up by wooden barriers that make a lot of noise when they're broken so they can alert defenders. Once the attackers have entered the building, they make their way to the defender's objective, which is usually one or two rooms inside of the building. When doing this, attackers begin to face obstacles like barriers and traps, as well as potential combat with the defenders, especially if some of those defenders have chosen to roam the map instead of staying on the objective. As the teams become more aware of each other's positions, most combat begins. It's important to note that in Siege, deaths are permanent until a round is over, so at this point in a match, it's likely that both teams are already taking casualties. If the surviving attackers make it to the objective, they end up having to break through the toughest defenses and go face to face face of the remaining defenders, eventually resulting in the end of the round. In my experience, most rounds end when one team wipes out the other team, but some rounds do end when the attackers successfully capture an objective or when the defenders run out the round timer. A full match in Siege consists of several rounds in which both teams of players will be on attack and defense at least once, and whichever team of players wins the most rounds wins the match. Siege is very competitive, and there's several reasons to this. For starters, Siege actually has a proper ranking system that that being a system where players go up against other players of a similar skill level and 
either rank down or rank up depending on their performance. TF2 does have its own competitive system that is similar to this, but it was actually released in an update about a year after Siege was already released, so Siege was actually the very first hero shooter to have a competitive system. Second of all, Siege's gameplay is just naturally competitive in nature. Teams in Siege only having 5 players means that cooperation and strategy in a team is absolutely the most important factor to a team's success, which is a hallmark of competitive video games. Last of all, the fact that everybody in Siege can be killed almost instantly makes precision and attention very important skills to have, which again is a hallmark of competitive video games. This quick and competitive combat is in contrast to previous hero shooters like TF2 and Garden Warfare, where combat encounters were longer and had more complexity to them than just being the first person to land a headshot. As I mentioned before, Siege is currently the most relevant hero shooter, at least by player count. Siege may have been released about a decade ago, but many updates within that time have kept it relatively fresh. Siege is especially popular among young people that spend a lot of time on the internet. This has a lot of consequences, such as players in a Siege match often coming together in the text chat to spell out slurs because that's the peak of comedy to a teenager of a poor sense of humor. More importantly, however, is that these teens and young adults are a large and very influential group on the internet. Many of them want content about their favorite game and creators provide. The Siege content spectrum is truly an amazing thing, with Siege content varying from large competitive events to some guy who likes talking about conductive metals or something. The general direction of the Siege community is in general contrast to the direction of the communities of other hero shooter games like TF2 or Overwatch. While TF2 and Overwatch's community focus a lot on the characters within those games, Siege's community does not. The Siege community focuses more on the gameplay and the burning pain that comes with it. Nobody really cares about the different operators and their individual personality traits and designs, especially not as much as some people care about other hero shooter characters like the TF2 mercenaries and all of the female heroes from Overwatch if you end up going to the place where the sun doesn't shine. Overall, the biggest thing that Siege brought to the hero shooter genre was bringing on the very first competitive game to the genre, while also further simplifying it just a bit. The complicated loadout system from TF2 is gone, now replaced with one that emphasizes variation in gameplay across different operators much less. Any given operator's primaries all still act as realistic guns, with the only variation being varying amounts of stats like firing and reload speeds across the different types of guns. This lack of weapon gameplay variation between operators is compensated for by the game just having a lot of operators to choose from. This is much like Garner Warfare's variation system in the sense that variation between characters is much more focused on abilities than on stats like health or speed. There are still stat variations from operator to operator in the form of speed and armor, but this doesn't create the same level of differences between operators as something like the differences between Heavy and Scout in TF2. From Siege onwards, all hero shooter games besides the Garner Warfare series focus on having a large roster of characters rather than having a diverse set of weaponry. The focus on precision, coordination, and tactics within Siege's gameplay provides a strong base for competitive gameplay. Couple this with the decent built-in competitive ranking system and the game's overall mature tone that helps to bring in a lot of attention from young audiences, and you get the most relevant hero shooter around at the time of this video's writing. Finally, the last major development Siege made to the genre was shrinking the size of teams to encourage gameplay where each teammate matters a lot more. TF2 and Garden Warfare had large teams that gave way to chaos and a sense of independence, because any given player's impact on their team's performance was usually not that massive. The difference between team sizes essentially splits the hero shooter genre into two distinct forms. Games with larger teams like TF2 and the Garden Warfare games are casual, chaotic, and have less importance placed on cooperation, and games with smaller teams like Siege, Overwatch, and Valorant are more competitive, predictable, and have importance placed on cooperation. <laughs> On February 23rd, 2016, almost exactly two years after the release of the first Garden Warfare, the world saw the release of Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2. GW2's similarities to the first game are very clear, with GW2 essentially just being a massive overhaul update. GW2 is a sequel that doesn't change any major aspects of the first game's core gameplay, which is foreshadowing for another sequel on this list. GW's biggest change is the addition of eight new playable characters, with four new characters granted to each team. Additionally, 
Finally, these eight new characters come with several variants, like the older characters. These new additions, combined with further alterations of variants and older characters, means that the game has about 110 different variants across all playable characters. Additionally, GW2 offers new abilities for characters that can be unlocked by leveling up any character. With this, you can essentially switch a loadout by picking different abilities to play with, although this is limited because the amount of abilities isn't that immense. The GW2's second biggest change is the addition of two new variants to the Garden Ops game mode from the first game. Those being the new zombie, those being the new, those being a new zombie edition, Graveyard Ops, and a new single player edition for both teams, Solo Ops. Graveyard Ops is just the direct opposite of Garden Ops. Instead of defending a plant garden, you defend a tombstone. Instead of dealing with waves of zombies, you deal with waves of plants. Instead of fighting zombie bosses, you fight plant bosses. Instead of planting plants for support, you spawn zombies and robots for support. On the other hand, Solo Ops, as the name implies, is the single player version of Garden Ops and Graveyard Ops. But you can still choose a team of up to three additional AI controlled allies. You can even switch between AI characters on your team, and they'll be exactly the same as they would if you or some other human was playing them. Unlocking new abilities is part of GW2's much more robust progression system, where players can level up and receive rewards like coins and new abilities. Each of the game's 110 variants have separate level counts that players can slowly level up, and the highest level that can be reached is level 50, which takes a lot of hours to get to. So to max out every single variant in the game, you'd probably need to play for over, you'd probably need to end up playing for over 10,000 hours, which is just pure insanity. However, the other part of the progression system is the same as in the first game, where players can spend coins that they either earn or purchase on sticker packs. Combine this with the leveling up system and the ranking system that I didn't mention for some reason, and you get a progression system that engages the player for a really long amount of time, even if most of that time is spent mindlessly grinding to level up. GW2 also added a new hub world called the Backyard, and GW2 is the only hero shooter to have something like it. It's a pretty cool thing, but it's really not too important to this video, so I won't go further into it. Overall, GW2 didn't add much of anything to the hero shooter genre. The biggest thing it introduced was its leveling up progression system for its different characters, which only really proved that such a leveling system could work in a hero shooter. Its other additions only really served to add more content to the game when compared to the first Garden Warfare, which is just not really a bad thing. It is a sequel after all, and unlike Team Fortress and Team Fortress 2, there was not a decade-long gap between Garden Warfare and Garden Warfare 2. It's just that this new content was mostly just an expansion of already established content, so it's not too important to the development of the genre. Oh my god, Peter, are you okay? No, I am not okay! As the hero shooter genre was stirring in its early development, one game company was taking notes, and that company was Blizzard, the creators of Overwatch, which was released on May 3rd, 2016. Overwatch is in many aspects the culmination of all previous hero shooters. It has the genre basics from the first Team Fortress, the lore and personality from TF2, the character abilities from the Garden Warfare games, and the competitive nature of Siege and its match sizes. This resulted in the game being a smash hit, both critically and player count wise quickly becoming one of the hottest games of its time. Overwatch ditches any and all character loadout customization, instead entirely relying on having a large amount of heroes to choose from. There's a lot of characters, but the game categorizes them into three main groups. There's the support group, which is healers like Mercy. There's damage, which is which are fighters like Tracer and all of the other people with high amounts of Rule 34 to their name. And there's Tank, which is beefier classes like Winston and Zahamter. This categorization means much more than it did in TF2 if it's categorization of classes into offense, defense, and support. Here, the roles matter so much that no team could function without having heroes from all three roles. As a result, teams are forced to have heroes from all three roles. A standard match of Overwatch is a 6v6, with each team forced to have two supports, two damages, and two tanks. This design, much like Siege's 5v5 design, gives way for a much more competitive nature than TF2 or Garden Warfare. Strategies and metas can be formed around these team restrictions, and for the most part, this was some good fun. Overwatch was praised for its 6v6 game mode because it made you feel more significant to your team than you could in other games, again, much like Siege. The 6v6 match was so important to the game that the developers would almost certainly never change it, especially not in a sequel or anything. While Overwatch stitches loadouts and character customization, each hero in the game still has a lot of depth. They have their primary weapons and abilities, but in a brand new addition to the genre, every hero has an ultimate. Ultimates are unique and powerful moves that a hero can unleash once they've built up their ultimate meter. 
Similar to Ubers in TF2, ultimates have the power to change the shape of the game by pushing or defending an objective much better than any other hero normally could. Ultimates are many things across many characters, like Winston's banana mode and McCree's bullseye. However, ultimates usually align of a hero's role. A support hero's ultimate is a big blast of support, a damage hero's ultimate is a big blast of damage, and a tank hero's ultimate does a bit of damage and a bit of tank. And McCree's, for example, Winston's banana mode makes him a deadly melee hero with a ton of health, and McCree's bullseye literally just lets you instantly demolish anybody you hit with it. Of course, ultimates are balanced by having a long charge time, so any player has to use their ultimate wisely and strategically. Ultimates are made possible by Overwatch's overall combat design, which is much more like TF2 and Garden Warfare's long-lasting complicated combat, and less like Siege's really quick and realistic combat. If you are fighting a tank, you can't just pop a calf in her head and have it over with, you have to spend a good amount of time chipping away at their massive health pool. This gives away for a lot of skill beyond having good aim, so Overwatch is a game where you have to be good at everything, from movement to timing. Overwatch, unlike its cousins TF2 and Garden Warfare, does not have a PvE game mode. However, back in the day, people realized that Overwatch had a lot of good potential for a good PvE mode, maybe even one that could beat NVM and be the greatest PvE mode of all time. Could you imagine? All of these heroes, each of their own upgrade trees that grant them new abilities and make improvements on others. As a result, people hoped that Blizzard would add a PvE game mode, but their prayers would not be answered within Overwatch 1. So, people held their breath for a good sequel to Overwatch that could maybe add a PvE game mode. Eventually, as time went on, the game grew older, content updates were running dry. It seemed as if the developers of the game were busy cooking up something big. Was it a big update? Was it a sequel to the game? Why not both? Overall, Overwatch was really important to the hero shooter genre. First of all, it reinforced the idea that games in a genre needed to have fun and unique characters like TF2 did, with each of them having funny one-liners and all of that good stuff. This isn't to say that Garden Warfare and Siege didn't have fun characters, but it's more pronounced in TF2 and Overwatch. Second of all, it had a good mix of a casual and competitive feeling within its gameplay. Overwatch isn't a dancing fest like TF2, but it also isn't a torture device like Siege. Third of all, it has ultimates, which is pretty cool. Last of all, Overwatch defined the hero shooter genre once and for all. Yes, the Team Fortress games may have been more instrumental to the development of the genre as a whole, but Overwatch stuck what it meant to be a hero shooter into the minds of people and developers. All around the gaming world, with the release of Overwatch, people now knew more than ever what a hero shooter was, and it was time for other games to capitalize on that potential. In the mid to late 2010s, at the same time that the hero shooter genre was stirring, another genre was also seeing its rise. With the release of hit games like, like PUBG and Fortnite, the battle royale genre was immensely popular. It was then that the fellas at Respawn Entertainment and our dear old friend EA had an idea. Why not take these two popular emerging genres and put them into one game? Thus, Apex Legends was born on February 4th, 2019. It was time for the hero shooter to move on from team-based multiplayer modes and enter the world of the free for Battle Royale. Okay, so I'm going to be honest with you, unlike every other game on this list except one other, I've never touched Apex in my life. I haven't spent much time with any of these games besides Siege and TF2, but with Apex, I've got absolutely nothing. I'm going to be doing my best with the use of terrible resources like fandom. Apex Legends can be most easily described as a baby between Fortnite and Overwatch. On one side, it has the fun character of Overwatch, with Apex Legends taking place in the same world as Respawn Entertainment's big series, Titanfall. On the other side, it has the general layout of a Fortnite match. This combination is unusual, but considering the fact that Apex made it into this video and didn't die in the Shadow Realm like Lawbreakers, the combination was a pretty good idea. Apex is really a unique game. There isn't really anything like it. There is no other battle royale hero shooter at the time of this video's writing. The core game mode of Apex is, like I've said a million times, battle royale. Players squad up into squads of three players, which is a really weird number. Each squad has to do the classic battle royale thing and be the last squad standing to win the game. Like like other battle royale games, squads are sent to a big open world map where they can collect a lot of loot like weapons. As the match progresses, the playable area on the map shrinks and the squads begin to collide with each other. Then things slowly escalate until only one squad is left standing. Where Apex obviously deviates from this battle royale design is in its incorporation of hero shooter mechanics. Players as of season 19 can choose from 25 legends. Legends being the name for playable characters in Apex, like heroes from Overwatch and mercenaries from TF2. Each legend has 
your own unique abilities like spawning walls or uh, supporting weapon based fighting. <clears throat> Apex isn't strictly a battle royale game and it has a lot of other game modes, with the most significant being arena mode. Arena mode is in many ways a return to the standard hero shooter formula. Arena mode is a deathmatch, squad vs squad game mode, or a 3v3. Besides that, there isn't really anything special to arena mode, with combat and abilities playing out in the same way as the wood in battle royale. However, I, I do find it interesting that, even in the hero shooter genre's most outlandish game, the original match format from Team Fortress still lives on in one way or another. It's like if the next Doom game was released tomorrow, and it was a beautiful action-packed bloody mess, but the game had a full 10 minute long segment where you have to suffer through Wolfenstein 3D. Not really a good comparison, but I'd like to think that at least one person watching this laughed at that. Overall, Apex didn't do too much to innovate either genre it was involved with. The basic idea of playing as a character of funny abilities is there for its hero shooter side, and so are the basic fundamentals of a battle royale game for its battle royale side. Really, the most innovative thing that Apex did was prove that the hero shooter genre could go beyond basic team-based multiplayer modes that were in previous games. It showed that experimentation within the genre could be a rewarding venture that could make a game both stand out and be popular. Just by looking at Apex, we can see that it marked the days that Team Fortress inspired hero shooters were long gone, as the days of Overwatch inspired hero shooters were now upon us. Today, I think it's easy to see that we are still in this era of hero shooter evolution, though challenges to Overwatch and its influence have come about. More on that later, though. It had been over three years since the last Chrono Warfare game, and the world was waiting for more. EA and its favorite puppet, PopCap, smelled potential for that sweet, sweet cash. And on September 4th, 2019, Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville was released. Like Apex Legends, I've never really messed with BFN, and before I started researching it, I expected nothing more than just more of the same from Chrono Warfare. However, I was proven wrong, as I uncovered why this game wasn't really all that popular with fans of the series. Battle for Neighborville had its core is really just more of Garden Warfare, and the game really just acts as a Garden Warfare 3. BFN has the same of everything, with a few changes here and there that are expected to be around with a sequel. You've got your new plants, and you've got your new zombies. Crazy Dave is committing his usual tax evasion, and Zomboss has started his rapping career. The graphics have become shinier to reflect 3 years of hardware evolution, and there's many more opportunities for EA to suck your wallet dry. What could go wrong? Well, there is one big change in BFN. The game removed the variation system in favor of an upgrade system that kind of does the same thing but doesn't. Every character has a bunch of upgrades that can be unlocked and used similarly to a loadout system. There's some universal upgrades and there's also some specific character upgrades. The universal upgrades are basic upgrades that can be applied to old characters. Character specific upgrades vary from just being specific upgrades to a character set of weapons to sort of bringing back some of the abilities from variations of previous games. For example, Chomper used to have a hot rod variation in GW2 and in BFN, that variation has been replaced by Hot. And in BFM, that variation has been replaced by a Hot Rod upgrade instead. In my opinion, this system is alright, but it does remove some of the fun from previous games that used to come from the variation system. Yeah, character variations were a pretty good feature because they changed around character abilities, but they were also a good feature because they changed the looks of the characters in fun ways that made you feel more accomplished for getting them. Due to the removal of character variations, BFN received a generally negative response from the Garden Warfare community, leading to pretty lacking player numbers. A lack of players meant a lack of income for the game, so EA decided to essentially just pull the plug on the game and there's been no major updates for the past few years. As a result, player numbers have gone even lower. Currently, Garden Warfare remains the most popular of the PvZ hero shooter games, so a combination of the game's old age and a lack of new content also means that GW2 isn't doing too well. Really, I think that BFN unfortunately dug the grave for the PvZ hero shooters and now, all that fans can hope for is that EA has mercy on the series and releases an improved sequel, which seems unlikely. Overall, BFN's contributions to the hero shooter genre were next to none. The new upgrade system that replaces the variation system essentially does the same thing, but removes the fun of having character variations. It's not unique in any sense, with it being similar to just about any loadout system, and compared to other hero shooter loadout systems, like from Siege and TF2, BFN's just doesn't work. In Siege, and especially in TF2, every weapon has its positives and its negatives, and this makes changing your loadout in those games fun, because you can think about how you can balance things out. In BFN, character upgrades are just that, upgrades, and there's no negatives to adding an upgrade to a character. While choosing an upgrade, the only trade-off for using one upgrade over the other is missing out on the positives of the other upgrade. 
With Apex Legends succeeding in mixing the hero shooter genre of battle royale mechanics, the door was open for other games to mix hero shooters of something new. The result was Valorant, which was released on June 2nd, 2020. In a pretty weird twist of fate, Valorant combines the hero shooter genre with one of its long lost siblings from the Quake mod days, Counter Strike. What's like of Apex Legends? The easiest way to describe Valorant is it being described as a child of two games. In this case, it's Overwatch and Counter Strike. It has the hero shooter mechanics and general character of Overwatch and the core gameplay mechanics of Counter-Strike. A match in Valorant is just like a match in Counter-Strike. Two teams go up against each other, one trying to complete an objective and the other team trying to stop that from happening. Each round of any match has a buying period where players can purchase weapons with money that they earn after each round. Most of the strategy in Valorant comes from choosing which weapons to buy at which times, so it's often just up to player preferences. Because of this buying system, Valorant doesn't really have a direct loadout system like TF2 or Siege, but still have some loadout mechanics within it. Where Valorant obviously diverts from Counter-Strike isn't its hero shooter mechanics. In Counter-Strike, players are exactly the same in every aspect, stat-wise at least. In Valorant, players can choose from different agents, which create variation from player to player. Each agent has four abilities divided into three categories, with two basic abilities, one signature ability, and one ultimate ability. Basic abilities are agent-specific abilities that are available to purchase during a buying period. Signature abilities are abilities that are free to use once per round, and ultimate abilities are abilities that charge up when players do things like getting kills or planting on the objective. Obviously, ultimate abilities are much like Overwatch's ultimates, and signature abilities are much like abilities in every other hero shooter than TF2. The basic abilities in Valorant are the most unique of the bunch, because of how they rely on the buying periods that are specific to Valorant. The only other hero shooter that I can think of that has something similar to Valorant's basics is TF2's power-up canteens, though those are pretty restricted to man versus machine. However, other than having the whole buying them thing, basics are really just like any other hero shooter ability. Valorant, like Overwatch and Siege, encourages a competitive playstyle through its design. All of the competitive shooter basics from those games are in Valorant, and although the agent system is more reminiscent of Overwatch's heroes, combat in Valorant leans toward being more like Siege's. Valorant has one of the largest competitive scenes in gaming, beating all other hero shooters like Overwatch and Siege, though it is still slightly smaller than its distant cousin, Counter-Strike. The result of this popular is Valorant being one of the more relevant hero shooters at the time of this video. This is a given, as it is currently the last hero shooter to have been released, if we choose to identify Overwatch 2 as nothing more than a glorified update to the first game, which it is. Overall, Valorant doesn't really contribute too much to the genre. It did just about the same thing that Apex Legends did by proving that the hero shooter genre could work with the framework of another game, with the game this time being Counter-Strike. In some ways, Valorant isn't even unique in this regard. Siege is a highly tactical hero shooter that has many of the mechanics mechanics of Counter-Strike, though the games aren't identical. Valorant has a much more robust ability system that introduces things like ultimates and it has a whole buying period system. Siege and Valorant also have huge differences in gameplay because Siege has far more tactical mechanics than Valorant, such as having cameras that players can use to do crazy things. Maybe if Siege had a buying period system, I'd be willing to say that Siege was the first game to combine hero shooters and Counter-Strike, but because it doesn't, I'd say that Valorant fits the bill better than Siege. Really, Valorant's lack of contributions to the genre's development is in a way its greatest contribution. Valorant shows that hero shooters are a mature genre. It draws from pretty much all previous hero shooters and packs them all into one well-developed package that had success. Valorant shows that in the future, hero shooters will be less focused on new additions to the genre's core design and instead will probably focus more on shaking things up by taking the genre in different directions. Okay, so they made Overwatch again, but this time it's free to play, which is pretty cool, but outside of that they messed up big time. Some heroes are now locked behind paywalls, and when these heroes are part of the game's meta, people who can't afford them or just don't want to buy them get locked out of playing that meta. They changed the match size from 6v6 to 5v5, which completely changed the gameplay. Instead of having two tanks, a team can now only have one tank. On paper, this sounds like it makes matches better by making them quicker maybe, as now there's only one tank to absorb damage. Instead, removing Having a tank makes it so damage classes don't have as much cover and die more often. Support classes need to put an extra effort to prevent their deaths, and the singular tank on a team gets put under more pressure. Removing a tank makes the game less fun for just about everybody, and I have no idea why Blizzard did it. Poor soul of this could easily be partially forgiven if Blizzard delivered on her promise to add an in-depth PvE mode to Overwatch 2. Instead, what we got was an empty husk compared to what we were promised. Overwatch 2's PvE game mode could have been the first hero shooter PvE mode 
out to beat TF2's NVM in quality and content, but it didn't happen. Overall, Overwatch 2 was nothing more than an update to the first game, glorified for profits through the sales of heroes and skins. The gameplay was broken by the weird change from 6v6 to 5v5, and a brand new PvE game mode failed to be anywhere close to what was expected. Blizzard underdelivered on all fronts, and this game casts an ugly shadow on the hero shooter genre today. In my opinion, the hero shooter genre has a decently bright future. At least if there's no more mistakes like Overwatch 2 and Battle for Neverville. If the genre continues to go in the general direction of Apex Legends and Valorant, where the genre gets mixed up into more genres, I believe that it will remain pretty good. At this point in time, I think that the hero shooter genre has been developed. Now it's just time for it to be refined and taken in interesting directions. But who knows, maybe we'll get a Team Fortress 3 that takes things back to the very beginning, but I wouldn't count on that considering what Valve is pretty famous for. For future games that have been announced and leaked, there's some Marvel superhero game that's coming out that doesn't seem that interesting, but there's also a potential new Valve game called Deadlock. Now, at the time of this video's writing, there hasn't been an official announcement for Deadlock from Valve, but if the leaks are true, we have something interesting on our hands. Valve's new game seems to be more like modern entries in the hero genre like Overwatch and Valorant, instead of being more like TF2. There is still a lot about the game that we don't know, but if this is true, this can mean two things. Either Valve has given up on making their new hero shooter special, or maybe we're about to get something that will make Valve the king of hero shooters once again. But who knows. Wow!